Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Adam Siegel, and as the guy who kicked off this morning's uh, uh, talk said, I, I direct the Council's uh, Digital and Cyberspace Policy Program. Uh, I just want to real quickly uh, thank all of the panelists uh, for coming uh, and participating in making this uh, such a great event. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Leila Adler, who uh, really uh, put most of this together, uh, coordinated with everyone, uh, and is making sure that every is going so smoothly, uh, and Alex Grigsby, who works with me as assistant director of the program uh, for helping uh, put it together. Uh, as uh, Richard mentioned, uh, the program has three focuses, uh, cybersecurity, uh, internet governance, uh, and digital trade and privacy issues. Uh, last year's symposium was on internet governance issue. Uh, probably next year we will start focusing on some digital uh, trade and privacy issues. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, major initiatives we launched this year, the blog, uh, which is uh, focused on a whole range of issues, and a number of uh, contributors, Rob Kanaki, uh, David Fiddler, myself, and a bunch of outside uh, authors. So if any of you have a blog post in you, uh, please write me and let me know. Um, we have a new uh, global governance monitor focused uh, on internet governance issues, uh, which is a great resource uh, if you're coming to the issue uh, new. Uh, and we have a new cyber brief series. Uh, we're on the fourth. Uh, we've looked at uh, radicalization on the web, uh, proportional responses to cyber attacks, uh, how you promote norms in cyberspace, and uh, government procurement and supply chain uh, IT uh, security. Uh, and we'll have another one coming out in about uh, two months. Uh, and as Richard mentioned, our, one of our main focuses is to bring uh, public and private sector together uh, to generate new ideas uh, and create new connections. So uh, during the day today, if you have uh, any ideas, what we should be doing, what we've uh, missed, uh, where we should be thinking, uh, please come up to me and let me know uh, where, we, uh, where we should be going forward. We have a uh, survey actually up on the blog uh, about what we should be covering. So if there are topics that we've missed, uh, I also ask you to, to, go, um, to go fill that out and let us know what we can be doing better. Uh, so thanks again to everyone for attending and for participating. And we'll now uh, start panel two. Welcome to the second session of today's Council on Foreign Relations Symposium. I'll remind everybody again that this session is on the record. Uh, the title of this session is Cyber Offense and Rules of the Road, and uh, we have three people joining me today for this conversation. Uh, my good friend Scott Charney, Vice President of Trustworthy Computing at Microsoft, uh, Anakin Tikringas, Senior Fellow for Cybersecurity and International at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and Chris Painter the cyber coordinator at the U.S. Department of State. So like the last session, you know, we'll, I'll have a little chat with them for a little while to get warmed up, and then we'll open the floor to questions. Um, I think to start, we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the rules of the road question. Uh, the previous session talked about a broad array of issues, and I think for each of them, you know, there are questions going forward about the rules of the road. A lot's been happening in this regard. And so I thought maybe I'd let uh, each of the, uh, the panelists talk briefly about you know, what their favorite aspect of the rules of the road issues are right now. And then I'll come back and we'll ask some questions. So Chris, why don't we start with you? Uh, so this has been really one of the major areas of focus for us, really for the last few years now. And it's been an area that by and large, I think the United States has led the debate on. And that is, this is not a space where nothing applies. This is not a free fire zone. And we've been very clear that one of the basic tenets of this is that international law applies in cyberspace, both the kind of international law that deals with things like the law of armed conflict and the UN Charter, but also below that very high threshold, international law applies. That's significant because if you say it doesn't apply and you need some new legal structure for the internet, uh, that itself could be destabilizing, but it also means that there are, there are, it is a free fire zone. It is a wild, wild west. The second part of the, the uh, initiatives we've been, we've been promoting is the idea that below that threshold, of uh, that very high threshold, which frankly we haven't seen much activity in, you need to uh, start thinking about 
norms of state behavior, things that states either should restrain themselves from doing or affirmatively do that makes the entire ecosystem in the long term more stable. And this complements the kind of de defensive and other issues that we just talked about in the last panel. And so, again, I think in a very short period of time, we made tremendous progress in not only taking forward this norm about theft of intellectual property that was discussed uh, extensively just now, but also uh, stability norms that include not attacking, for instance, the critical infrastructure of another state in peacetime, uh, not, uh, not attacking the cert or C cert of another state, that states should not do that, that you, they should use certs for good and not bad, not for offensive purposes, uh, which is not always true now. And then finally, that uh, a state, when asked, should cooperate with another state when malicious code is coming from their territory, uh, to either mitigate it through law enforcement or technical channels. Uh, and these are really important because we started promoting these just recently and we got you know, pretty wide take up of them pretty quickly in this UN group of the governmental experts, uh, which if you think of international relations and moving things forward, getting that kind of uh, consensus in just a couple of years I think is, is remarkable. And then the third part, the third part of the structure is a confidence building measure. This is an area where there's not a lot of understanding between states. This is an area where there's a lot of uh, chances of misperception, miscalculation, and inadvertent escalation. So how do you address that, particularly when you have difficult issues of attribution? Well, this is the one area where I think there's a parallel to the nuclear world, where confidence building measures played a pretty large role. And these are things, they're not rocket science, though. They're things like transparency measures, you know, making sure you have points of contact, perhaps hotlines, other things that you can do along those lines. Um, they could be cooperative measures, cooperating against shared threats, and ultimately stability measures, which I think merges nicely with norms. So that framework altogether has been something we've been advancing. And again, I think big success there in having the OSCE adopt a set of 11. I don't know why it could have been 10, but it was 11. It's like the Spinal Tap movie. But, uh, but you know, 10 uh, confidence building measures, which are important in now implementing it. We've done a workshop just recently in the, the ARF. And then I think going forward uh, in Singapore, we did it in partnership with Singapore for those countries. But going forward, I think one of the major things we need to do is get wider and wider acceptance internationally of these norms. And that really is a major administration and presidential, absolutely presidential priority to really promote these norms, this concept of international law, this framework. Uh, around the world and getting this more universally accepted. And you've seen this in a lot of the statements that have come out of when there are leader statements coming out of the White House recently, the Osman statement, uh, the ministers of uh, uh, defense and uh, foreign affairs from the State Department. Uh, this is, I think, something that we really are going to be concentrating on over the next year and really beyond that. And I think, uh, although this is not the silver bullet for everything, this helps create a more stable environment. Annika, you want to? Yeah, well, I guess my favorite parts of um, the norms uh, conversation is that uh, it's all the same norms, just the, rule, the, the, just the, just the road is different. And uh, with the road being different, I think for, uh, for a lawyer, what is really exciting is that uh, we are seeing norms meeting, um, meeting other concepts. So uh, lawyers are really challenged to think how to make those old rules and norms uh, work in uh, on this new road. So going to the framing of this panel, for example, I think that norms uh, in and of themselves have come to constitute an important deterrent. So I would say that uh, in this uh, norms uh, discourse and then uh, when it comes to a spectrum of, of deterrents, then uh, we are really talking about one track and we are now using norms to, uh, to answer the questions that uh, well traditionally we used to look in stovepipes stove pipes, and therefore maybe apply um, strictly the sort of stovepipe solutions to them. But now we see that, uh, as was mentioned in the last panel, we're, de uh, we're dealing with a threat uh, surface. And on that threat surface, we see different actors. And in a way, they interact in ways that challenges us to use those old norms and potentially develop new practices on those norms. That means to rethink of how we implement those norms for the purpose of deterring very different actors. So that's to me, is the, I think, what's the fun part. Uh, um, so we are a big fan of norms, and in part because um, we believe there's too much short of war activity on the internet. And it's interesting when you think about the fact that in times of war, we have norms like the Geneva Convention, 
which require discreteness and proportionality in your military activities, but there's no Geneva Convention in times of peace. And, but having said that, I think the challenge isn't so much saying international law applies. The devil's in the details. So, you know, as a former cybercrime prosecutor, we said existing laws apply to the Internet. Then you look at the Electronic Communications Act and other laws, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, and you find it incredibly hard to apply those existing laws to the new environment. And so, yes, international law applies. And I think we would all agree that if a foreign country flew a fighter jet over the U.S. and dropped the bomb on U.S. property, we'd say that's an act of war. But if a foreign country accessed physical property through the Internet and caused kinetic damage, how many people would say it's the same thing, it's an act of war? So the real problem is how do we apply these rules in this environment? Um, and at what level do we want attribution? So one of the big challenges in all of this, including the new Chinese-U.S. agreement, is how do you determine whether or not people are actually following the norms? And people have gotten into this space in the Internet where they go, because it's hard to do authentication, because it's hard to do traceability, there's always plausible deniability. But that's just not true. I mean, in the physical world, in the United States, people can be sentenced to death on a lower standard called proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So what is the standard we want to use in deciding when norms have been violated? So there are a lot of devils in the details that have not been worked out. I think one of the biggest challenges in my mind uh, as we talk about norms is the relative uh, sophistication and I'll say contribution of the non-state actors in, in this generation of problems, at least when we're talking about good guy, bad guy norms. There's many other issues, too. Um, because the asymmetric uh, capabilities are so high compared to historical standards, uh, what do we do with the non-deterrable people? What should be the advantage if you are, let's say, a deterrable actor, a nation state and you decide, I, I'm going to comport with norms. What should you get for that agreement relative to the threat that comes from those that can't be deterred or who aren't going to agree to the norms, whether they're a nation state or a non-state actor? So, Thoughts, anybody? So I mean, I, I think you, you can break it down in a couple different ways. First of all, uh, there is conduct by states. There is conduct by criminals. There is conduct by perhaps rogue states or, or, or others out there. So. You know, you have to tailor how you deter each of that kind of conduct and how you control it in the future by the actor to some extent, even if you don't always know who the actor is. So that's why it's important to have strong cybercrime laws in place, something Scott and I had spent much of our career trying to do, and I'm, we're still promoting very heavily to have countries have the ability to deal with that. Uh, but when we talk about some of these voluntary norms that I've talked about and what would, would bind states or, you know, where, where states could bind together if you get a, great, a large like-minded group, is it's, it's very much like things like the Non-Proliferation Initiative, where those uh, countries who are part of this, those large tent like-minded countries, can band together to act against transgressors, people on the outside. So yes, you're never going to get every single state, particularly rogue, rogue actors, to sign up to it. But this gives you a better way to try to enforce it. The, the only other thing I'd say, just one comment on, on what Scott said. You know, I think uh, there's always this thinking that cyberspace, and I agree that how the rules and things like proportionality, et cetera, apply is going to keep lawyers busy for a while, uh, speaking as a recovering lawyer. Uh, but I think that the, the, the bigger, uh, one of the, the issues that we can't lose sight of is you look at the effects. I mean, it, it, if there's major death and destruction caused by a cyber attack, you look at the effects, you don't necessarily look at the means. Yeah, I, uh, absolutely. When it comes to uh, effects like that, then there is, uh, at that point of time, no, no doubt that the law of armed conflict would apply. I think the, the question, too, lies um, where you're pointing, which is how do we deter potentially those other actors? Now, why use the, the word deter? Meaning, um, I think one of the biggest challenges all of us face, and uh, that uh, concerns like everyone, uh, my age and, and up uh, who hasn't uh, been in the computer industry for, for their lifetime is that uh, we are not native to this technology. And, and that means that we have to deal with two variables. One is our own discipline concepts, such as legal concepts, uh, armed attack, 
a use of force, uh, what is a crime, and then the, the reality of technology. And now pairing them together, we are not used to taking our old concepts out of their paradigms. That means deterrence. I would come back to what is it about? It's about changing someone else's behavior. And we can think about it as this uh, potential of military response or military force or, or forcible measures being used um, against an attacker. But I would say that we can think about it uh, in terms of uh, cyber much more differently and, and how we incentivize those other attackers that uh, maybe cannot uh, be deterred under under our traditional thinking, then in terms of punishment, we can think of, yes, effective law enforcement, right? Meaning where that works, that deters at least mainstream attackers. We can think of economic, uh, economic sanctions. Uh, we are more and more talking about cyber sanctions. We are be, have seen SWIFT being used uh, to uh, deter or to sh change behavior. <coughs> that means the World International uh, Banking uh, System uh, uh, sanctions against countries, and potentially there are DNS sanctions against countries. So, so we can deter by by other than just forcible measures, and then we can think about denial, and that's where the, these different groups of actors come to play, because we create denial by better security, by design, by architecture. We create uh, better uh, uh, denial by reinforced targets, meaning uh, focusing on infrastructure, we want to be a safe side. We can uh, actually create denial by better attribution. Uh, that means cooperation between countries who together can create that effect of attribution. Or uh, even costs, meaning that uh, if we raise the costs of attacks by all that, that uh, deters uh, both state and non-state actors. So uh, norms aren't designed to deal with criminals. By definition, they violate social norms. They're criminals. And you know, norms are about self-restraint for mutual benefit by governments. And if they're using people as proxies, then speaking like a lawyer a little bit, the normal rules of agency apply, which is if you're not supposed to do something, then you shouldn't hire someone to do it on your behalf. The real problem is attribution and proof again, which is you know, when do you claim that this organization is a proxy for a government? <coughs> the other thing is if you also have a norm, which the governments are, you know, um, a touting, which is there shouldn't be safe havens for criminals. One of the ways you think about checking the validity of the norm is, okay, if you claim um, that you are not uh, supporting this activity, then what are you doing to stop it? Mm -hmm. It's a comment you kind of famously made once to a government where you said, well, if you're not doing it, you're not stopping it. Either way, you're the problem. And, and I'd say one of the interesting things uh, about actually the last UG report in 2013, and again, this time is saying that states should not be able to do things that they're prohibited from doing by using proxies. Now, determining who those proxies are and going after them, you know, somewhat of a challenge, but not an insurmountable challenge, I would argue. And then, I, you know, I also, uh, I also think that this idea of states cooperating, and we've seen this even in the, the China agreement uh, or China understandings is that the setting up this ministerial mechanism is there's an expectation. You're, if we see malicious code coming from your country, we see things that you're going to help try to mitigate it. One thing, Chris, you said that I agree with. And Just one thing? Well, <laughs> the I'll say one of the last things. That it is this idea that if you agree to a set of norms, then a benefit or is that if you're not going to do it, then you ought to, in fact, be willing to get together with other people who've agreed not to do it and prevent others from doing it. And I think that that, that is something that really needs a lot of reinforcement. I think that whether it's crime or, or just bad actors, even in that case, it really boils down then to the enforcement mechanism. One of the things, uh, and Anakin mentioned it, but, but I'm increasingly worried about is what I call the weaponization of the banking system uh, in the sense that it's become very convenient for people to decide, well, you're doing something we don't like, and therefore the way we're going to stop, you know, sanction you is we're going to basically apply economic sanctions uh, up to and excluding access to the banking network, as you mentioned. But in the world of the Internet, we know today, um, you see other new technologies emerging, things like the blockchain and Bitcoin. You see uh, terrorist actors already creating their own currencies. You know, what do you think the issues are uh, from an enforcement point of view? We don't have the equivalent of a UN peacekeeping force. 
We don't, you know, have, as the last panel mentioned, effective uh, multilateral, you know, treaties uh, that really operate well in a uniform way on the criminal uh, prosecution side. And, and so, you know, how do you see these things stirred together? Should we be looking at some kind of collaborative peacekeeping capability on the internet? Um, you know, what is, what are our other mechanisms other than economic sanctions, uh, particularly for the people that increasingly we're caring, uh, making don't care about our banks, uh, to try to get some enforcement, whether it's norms or laws? Want to start this time? Okay. Well, I mean, I, I think there are a number of things. First of all, uh, sanctions, I think, are an effective tool to reach people, uh, and, and these what they were designed for, to reach serious conduct and conduct that may, the other tools we have uh, may not be able to reach. It's not the exclusive tool, certainly. There's law enforcement, there are other tools, or diplomatic tools. We say in our international strategy from 2011 that it, depending on the level of the incident, we have a full suite of tools, trade tools, now sanctions tools, criminal tools, diplomatic tools, the whole range. And so I, I think that that's important. I, I would say that there is, in terms of uh, um, you know, in the cybercrime area, the Budapest uh, Convention now is, you know, it's more and more adherents are joining it every day, and there's a list that they're going to join it soon. The fa and other ones have actually emulated its provisions, so even if they haven't joined it. So the siren song about having a new global cybercrime convention, which uh, you know, Scott will remember well, it took five years to even get this convention, would actually not help any of the countries out there really fight this. And then this idea, I think, that I've heard a few times of some kind of global instrument treaty to deal with, uh, with some of these uh, uh, cyber warfare, cyber weapon, cyber security. Issues. You know, I don't think that really gets you very far either. That's why, you know, frankly, I don't think we're at all close to being mature enough to even understand what the different aspects of this are. I think this is still a fast-moving technology. I, again, don't think that's going to be effective in making us safer. So that's why so much of our effort has been put into these norms and confidence-building measures, which are more voluntary. How do you enforce it? Uh, you know, I, don't, I think if you create some big institution, the, it will fall on its own institutional weight. So how do you do it? like we do with a lot of other areas, frankly, and we have traditionally, which is banding together with more like-minded uh, nations to go after this. I think that's happening. I, I'll give you an example. Even in the, uh, it was raised in this last panel about um, the attacks, the denial of service attacks on our financial institutions, which was not the end of the world. I mean, it was a major nuisance, but it wasn't changing the, uh, the integrity of the information or other things that would have been much more serious. But nevertheless, it was a serious issue, and we, reached out to countries around the world, even diplomatically, to try to get, uh, to build this idea of collective action against these threats. And so usually you'd have the CERT people reach out and the law enforcement people reach out. But we did diplomatic demarches, which before I came to state, I always thought demarche sounded bad. But you could have a good demarche. You can say, can you help us? Can you work with us? And, and we're going to be willing to help you if you come to us. So building those kind of collaborative networks, I think, is really the way to go. Other thoughts? Yeah, I would maybe just maybe just uh, bring a different angle to it. Well, the <coughs> distributed denial of service attacks against banks didn't start with uh, us recognizing uh, hard security threats uh, in and around cyber. And I think the positive effect of all this is that, uh, referring back to uh, uh, what Michael Daniel has uh, brought up earlier, this uh, understanding of new normality and us uh, being increasingly exposed to sophisticated and... Uh, and um, intensive cyber threats has led to a situation where our banks are much better defended. So meaning they, uh, they, it creates this incentive for the private sector to sort of self-heal. Uh, it's not to say that that is the, the end of it and, and uh, that it should all be left there, but now we come to what are we doing about this at the international level? So what are we doing? Uh, Chris mentioned the UNGGE report and one of the things that was uh, clearly echoed there but didn't start there was this understanding that we need to uh, abstain from uh, malicious and hostile acts against the critical infrastructure. Uh, there is some mutual benefit in that framework, and especially when it comes to these key infrastructures, which the financial system is, uh, is one. Telecommunications today is clearly the other because it brings benefits, uh, both social and economic, to countries across the world. And uh, I would say uh, grids, power grids are the third one. And, and some 
others in the pipeline. So why I wanted to mention that it start, didn't start the, start the GG and of course it won't end there because we're still to elaborate what exactly is to be protected and how. Uh, the US has uh, tabled uh, years ago at the UN uh, something called the uh, proposition of the global culture of cybersecurity. And that has developed over years to enc encompass this understanding what countries ought to be doing about protecting their critical infrastructure and, uh, and how, how, how are we improving on that. So all in all, I think there is uh, some really important progress and, and what I find really useful is that that progress happens in tandem. It's about protecting yourself as a private sector entity, realizing that you're a flagship of a company in a political situation, and then uh, your government and actually all governments uh, helping you do that. I, th I think we have to think about where technology is headed and how to integrate technological solutions with policy solutions. I'm reminded of a story in the early 90s when I first became uh, at the Justice Department responsible for cyber crimes. Many of the attacks on the universities, the internet was much more wide open than it is even today, uh, many of the attacks were coming from a single university. Um, and other universities complained about the fact that when they were being inundated with these packets, they couldn't get much help. And that university from which all the packets were coming said, hey, we have an open network, the internet is free, anybody can sign in, we don't care. So the other university said, okay, we're going to drop all your packets. And suddenly that university had a security regime in place. And you know, one of the things we have to think about is the world's going to be more authenticated. You know, people often say, do we want security or privacy on the internet? The answer is yes. You can't think about it at the internet level. You have to think about it at the application level. You know, if you're doing online banking, the bank wants you to be authenticated. You want to be authenticated. If you're going to do a blog post on a controversial topic, you want to be anonymous. And democracies want you to be anonymous so that you have free speech. But if you start thinking about that layer, you could start saying, well, maybe part of the solution is not just economic sanctions, but internet-related activities. I mean, we just have to think outside the box about what, you know, we've all said that governments, as part of this whole norms process, as it addresses these problems, should use all the tools in its toolkit. But when the government thinks about what those tools are, they tend to think about their traditional tools. I think we have to have a more expansive discussion about what is the tool set for the digital age to make sure that people are adhering to norms, if you believe in them. So if you think about both the previous panel's discussion and some of the comments we just had here, I think that a couple of things are going to have to happen. Uh, one is more this idea that we have to come up with a model of protection that is not just making everything perfect. You know, we've been for decades on the let's make everything perfect and then we won't have a problem. And I think the complexity of the system is such that we know that that's, uh, you know, you want to be as good as you can be, but you can't ultimately be perfect. Uh, and so that's going to require more of this uh, sort of high scale observation and, and monitoring and we talked a bit about it, and the legislation that was discussed this morning kind of shows how difficult it is to find a balance even narrowly between the privacy issues and the other. We all mention every day about the problems of attribution, you know, whether it's some attack that's coming from somewhere or just a crime that you want to be able to prosecute. How sure are you about that? You just mentioned this idea of uh, authentication. What do you think the prospects are or, or should be for establishing norms relative to this question of identity authorization, you know, access control, uh, in order to get at this question of attribution? And while I agree with your comment, Scott, that, that you don't want to make this something that, that is applied at the infrastructural level, you want to apply it sort of domain by domain, you know, how do you think we can get movement in this quickly, because I think it, it lies at the heart of a qualitative change in our ability to protect and to, and to enforce. So I actually think you see that happening. It's been a long time coming, but you see it happening both on the government side and on the private sector side. So on the government side, you see some countries issuing national identity cards um, with strong enrollment processes, because the key is how did you enroll people in the system. Um, the U.S. has the TIC program where they're funding 
um, various projects to do um, driver's license related and person proofing to generate ID cards. And so governments who are recognizing they need to protect citizens from fraud and protect taxpayer money from fraud are moving in that direction. On the industry side, what you've seen over the last you know, year, year and a half, is this massive move to biometrics with uh, authentication that is bound to machines through trusted platform modules, whether it's a laptop or a phone or a PC, so that people can now have a biometric ID that's signed by a machine and passed to a relying party. And the point is not, as I said, to authenticate everything. It's to authenticate the things where authentication is appropriate, but that also allows you to filter out those things that you don't want that might be trouble. I mean, just think of how much spam and phishing we have, right? Um, one of the beauties of this system is you can give up credentials and it doesn't matter. But as these technologies move forward, you can see some interesting applications. So for example, my mailbox should tell me whether this mail that is I am receiving is being signed by someone I recognize or that a government has recognized or not. It doesn't mean I can't get unauthenticated mail, but at least I'll know it's unauthenticated mail. And if I see that it's asking me for my banking password, but it isn't signed by my bank, that's kind of a clue. And so I think you see the technology moving in this direction and governments moving in this direction. And the real important thing is to make sure that we don't go too far and say, if you're not authenticated, you can't be on the internet and you can't engage in speech activities and other things. We have to strike that balance. Yeah. And in fact, you know, the, the back a couple of years ago, and Scott was involved in this too, the, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, I looked at this and I think one of the things, and, and Scott's quite right, you don't want to go too far you don't want to somehow make anonymous speech impossible because there's lots of good reasons for it, but for critical things that you need authentication, you want to have that as an option. And I think that is largely a private sector driven initiative, although there's some authentication that goes with it. And I think that's something we are, you know, I've seen, like Sky, I've seen a lot more progress. I, I remember a time, and you all do uh, too, when, uh, you know, when certain institutions were faced with big losses because of fraud and other issues, they just ate the cost. They said, you know, this is a, a cost of doing business. But there's another effect, which is the effect on co uh, consumer confidence and, and just reputation. And I think in the last couple of years, really, we've seen a switch to that. So there's a lot more uh, emphasis on that, and I think that's a good thing. But perfect attribution is not, even as a former uh, prosecutor, perfect attribution, not so great uh, for lots of good reasons. The other thing on the attribution uh, issue is that people always think of this as binary. They think the only way you can do attribution is through the technical channels to follow the digital footprints. And that's just not the case. You look at, uh, you look at all the different things that you could. In a criminal case, you might follow the money. You're gonna look at some you know, uh, other witnesses. You're gonna see what kind of other intelligence you have. We were quite clear and sure, for instance, that North Korea did the, I mean, there wasn't a doubt in our mind, despite some people thinking there was a doubt, there wasn't a doubt in our mind. So there's ways to do it. The other thing is, it's easier to do attribution when you have sustained activity, which is often the more damaging activity than a one-off quick hit. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't think attribution, although it complicates issues and it continues to do so, is insurmountable. Yeah, it, uh, for a second it was always, um, I was wondering why does it seem a non-question to me and uh, it is because I come from a country where, uh, well, we, I come from, I come from a country with probably the strongest public key infrastructure, I put it in other words, in Estonia it is natural that banks and, and, and government function on the same, same secure identification uh, uh, platform, every citizen carries a, a national ID card that also serves as its uh, uh, electronic transaction uh, device, basically. So it is working, the point of that, without no, necessarily going into details about Estonia, is that some things in uh, comprehensive integrated cybersecurity are easier for smaller countries, just by size itself, and then of course by agility and uh, how much that country has invested into policies and, and sort of lifestyle that's dependent on it. And Estonia has really got it right a long time ago and it is in these, these terms really functioning. Not, not to say at the same time that there are no issues for us. So, and this, is, this comes now to the other side of identification uh, and attribution for part of it, uh, which means uh, we still have to work uh, to improve our forensics capabilities, to work with other countries, to share information, to uh, exchange information on uh, uh, 
uh, third level, computer emergency response teams uh, level, and uh, then uh, of course uh, rely on the capabilities of our allies and friends, including NATO's capabilities when it comes to a certain type of uh, network awareness and monitoring. So, uh, and finally, I would just point out uh, one thing that I think that uh, constitutes a cost to this identification uh, race, which is uh, uh, oftentimes when you uh, opt in for identification, uh, that results in a lot of spam and, uh, and advertisement. And that's another sort of uh, thing to definitely regulate, uh, not necessarily by law, but maybe by policies. Yeah, and of course, in the US, you know, we see an oscillation as a function of how, how distant the last great big bad thing was. You know, when bad things happen, you know, the, the U.S. population generally swings more towards saying, I'll accept more measures focused on security and I, maybe an identity, you know, and then it swings gradually back toward, toward the privacy environment. Estonia, of course, as a society and a country, had it, its own, you know, wake-up call in cyberspace some years back, and, and, and so, you know, I think it's, it's often easier, whether you're big or small, to get people to mo be motivated to do these things when they have a fresh memory or a, a consistent uh, threat, you know, that, that is present in front of them. And I think that's one of the challenges we have right now in many countries is people have both a threat of privacy violation and a threat of crime and, and other bad things happening. And, and therefore, it's more difficult to find the balance. So I'm going to pursue one more question, then I'm going to open the floor to the audience. So think about what you uh, want to ask. Um, in the panel, uh, the first panel this morning, you know, we, they talked a bit about uh, the legislation. And one of the things the legislation talked about was near real time. And yet everybody acknowledged that you really want to get to real time. And I think in many aspects, whether it's you know, cyber warfare, and in particular, I'll say cyber defense in a new model, uh, I think we're going to increasingly find that speed is critical. Because the thing that is qualitatively different about the internet threats is the combination of speed and scale. And so if you don't want scale to happen, you better intervene quickly. And these things occur at a speed that humans don't move at or think at. And so what do you think the issues are going to be from a legal point of view, and I'll say a liability point of view, for companies strictly operating in a self-defense environment who get to the point where they have non-man-in-the-loop intervention in order to safeguard their infrastructure? But say, for example, you know, our old, my old company, your current company, Microsoft, or any other giant cloud provider, if you come under attack, and you decide that you're going to essentially protect the infrastructure to live in a, and fight another day or do business another day. But in doing so, you now take perhaps thousands or hundreds of thousands of companies and momentarily disrupt their business because they're all sort of have a concentrated dependency on these super scale cloud services. Um, how do you think that we ought to deal with the liability there? You know, you could say, well, I'll, I'll try to stay up and, or open and, and, uh, and keep you alive, but if I die, then everybody loses. If I take action instantly because I think I might be able to survive, but I have these side effects, how do you think we ought to control that kind of liability for businesses? Because I think, my own view is, uh, and I'll just close with this thought, somebody asked earlier about the balance of government spending between their offensive capability and their defensive capability. And I think a hidden uh, reason that you see that discrepancy today is that today, offense is the business of the government, but defense is the business of business. And in the past, that wasn't really true. When people thought in military terms, they, they usually think, well, the government both made the weapons and used the weapons, and they had to defend against the other guy's weapons. But increasingly in this world, you know, the government isn't actually, they're making the weapons to, to exploit flaws that come from the commercial product. And, uh, and, and the, so the defense is going to fall to the business sector. And, uh, and so I think, you know, there's a confluence of these things that at least I'm worried about in thinking how do we get the, the sort of the liability issues right in this environment. 
So I, I think it's a very hard problem, and I'd say that for a few reasons. And the first is, even if you don't say there should be strict liability, but liability for negligence, which is the classic liability standard, you have to decide what's the reasonable standard of care. And in fast-moving environments with a lot of change, it's often hard to define with clarity what is the reasonable standard of care. Then the second problem is whether you've met that reasonable standard of care. And yes, you might take some defensive action that you know, injured someone but saved many. And then the question is, is that a reasonable thing to do? Um, but the other thing I worry about is, with the speed of automation, one of the things we think a lot about is could we denial of service ourselves by accident? You know, if you basically have machines that are executing automatically on a range of things, you look at the, uh, the flash crash on Wall Street where algorithms were just triggering because of other algorithms without human intervention and suddenly you have this effect. And you know, we can do things like we can block packets, but if we do that in an automated way, we may end up denial of servicing ourselves. And then the next thing I worry about is machine learning, which is you know, one of the things that Microsoft Research, which you led for a long time, um, said to me, which gave me pause and I had to think about it, is once you really embrace machine learning, where machines take in a lot of data and learn from that data, Sometimes the machine learns things that surprise even you. Like, even though you wrote the algorithms, once they're free to learn, they're kind of like my kids. Sometimes I give them a message and it comes out funny, right? And so what's going to happen is machines might start making decisions on our behalf that we didn't even anticipate and wasn't even predictable. And how do you apply the reasonable standard of care to that? So, there's no easy that answer. Be, but that may be the only way protection ensues in the future. That's right. And I will say, you know, there are, there is this also concern, as you raised, about the difference between defense and offense, which is companies can do a lot of defense. But once governments, for example, start automating offensive reactions, you get into, I give John Badham great credit. 1985, he did war games. Um, long before people were thinking about these potentials. But if we allow the machines to decide on our behalf when to strike out at other people, and then you add machine learning to that, you know, how close to Terminator have we come is the question. Closer every day. So, so A little more? Go. And you want to go? I could, I could go. Uh, well, I would uh, take the machine uh, out of the loop <laughs> in a way because, uh, well, it's not to say that machines are not going to be there, uh, but I would not take humans out of the loop. And so I would uh, get this conversation towards uh, what are we seeing in terms of trends in legislation that uh, directly touch upon uh, people who still have and will have responsibility for their business, uh, regardless of the, uh, they do, whether they decide to use machines or not. And I would um, like to go back to a court ruling from 1920s, and this DJ Hooper case. And uh, the, the logic that follows from there is that if there is a technology available that is not unaffordably expensive and it's known to save lives or, or property, then you ought to have it. And, like uh, machine learning. Uh, and the very, very logic or the very idea of that is that it's just a new technology after all. And of course it's complicated, it's complex, and we're yet learning uh, how to apply it all, but the principles are all the same and we can make use of them. Now some of the examples of how it's happening, we are already seeing that the responsibility for technology in a company is moved from CTO level, CIO level to CEO level. What that means is that uh, our manager, executive man managers are made responsible for data protection, for consumer protection, for intellectual property protection, for all those uh, uh, handles that support business uh, in information systems. And adding to that uh, insurance and the required sort of uh, standard of agility from those, it really comes to the point where your liability is attached to your business model. If you are a defense contractor, then your business risk is higher. If you are an e-commerce company doing online dating, well, then your business risk is there. And we ought to be better just at uh, attaching sort of right labels to those 
liability handles. Before we so go to get, Chris, let's get the contracts right. Mm -hmm. But before we go to Chris, I, I want to touch on one thing you said. Because uh, we've seen this, you know, on Patch Tuesday of every month, we issue all these patches and we do massive mm -hmm. testing before we issue. And then you have Exploit Wednesday because the bad guys reverse engineer the patch and then send out their exploits. And they don't do testing. They just let it go. And if it doesn't work quite right, they don't care. The problem with keeping the human in the loop on defense is there's no requirement that a human be in the loop on offense. Right. And so the real problem becomes, even if you're only using machine technology for defense, the fact is there are implications to all your users when you're at hyperscale. And if you say you've got to keep a human in the loop but your adversary does not, how are you going to keep up? Maybe just very short on that. The question I think for me becomes, if we put human out of the loop, the question becomes, can machines be strategic about what we have to achieve? If the answer is no, then we have to make sure that something else is more strategic there. And, and I'd say it's kind of a, a blend. So if you're talking about you know, network defense at the perimeter, doing things where you're looking at signatures, you're blocking them, you're not just shuffling them off to say, OK, here's something we need to look at later. And this has been a lot of the move in the Einstein, the other system. I think that's generally a good thing, because the second order consequences aren't going to be as large if you're simply blocking malicious activity and taking mitigating actions within your systems. Uh, I think where it gets a lot more complicated and where you still, because the policy, frankly, is not developed in this area, it gets more complicated when you go outside of your systems and you have, uh, you have a range of second order effects. So to give you an example, uh, if one of the tools you have, you know, we talked a little bit about this in the last panel, this idea of hacking back. Uh, that's bad if you do it in person. It's even worse if you have uh, automated responses because there are, you could be hitting innocent third-party victims domestically and internationally. You could be violating sovereignty. You could be escalating without even knowing it. You don't want to do any of those things. So that, that's true. Uh, the other thing is, let's say you were just saying, OK, we need to go out and one way to mitigate a botnet is to go and issue a code to turn them all off everywhere. Again, there are huge legal issues behind that, and there are huge sovereignty and international issues behind that. So, so you can't really automate that as well. So when people talk about automation as this sort of, you know, that's the way we're going to solve all of this, I think we have to be cognizant of some of the limitations there. It doesn't mean that in time we can't think about some processes and, and have some of the international discussions you need to have for this. Uh, but I still think you, you still need uh, a man, not a man in the middle of attack, but a man in the middle to actually uh, help think about the second order effects. But I think there's a lot you can do, you know, at the perimeter, at the cloud. Uh, you know, I, I, you talked about the risk of shutting down a lot of uh, people because you decide to shut down your own system. There's a lot of short of shutting down your own system that you can do in terms of blocking and mitigating attacks in, in cloud services and, and domestically. Uh, and I think from a liability perspective, one of the ways you deal with that is your terms of service with the various customers. So uh, I'd also agree with Scott that you know, even though we are a naturally litigious society, it's been very interesting, because I remember talking about this literally 20 years ago, that someday there'd be a standard of care that'd be developed for this, and there still really isn't. And now I, I think that as we think, and this more, it gets more mature, and people even start adopting voluntary standards, that will develop over time. Uh, but that's not been a driver. Yeah, the NIST framework stuff was sort of a push down the direction of creating some you know, uniform standards. So let's open the floor now to, to the uh, people, the members in the audience. Uh, wait for the microphone. Tell us who you are, uh, your name and affiliation, and try to, if in this case, direct your questions to one of the panelists if possible. We'll start right here. Hi, uh, Joe Marks from Politico. This is for Chris and probably for Anakin too. So since the... Um, no commercial hacking agreement with China. Two things have happened. One, there's not been any real evidence either way whether China is complying to the extent that the US would agree its compliance. Um, two, a seemingly similar agreement was uh, agreed between uh, China and the UK, and Germany has said it's interested in a similar agreement. So um, one, what's your reading of this proliferation of similar agreements? What does that mean for this as a developing norm of some kind, and then two, if there are more agreements but no compliance, is there still some value to these agreements? Or uh, conversely, do a lot of agreements that no one's honoring damage the cause of commercial spying being verboten? 
So, so I think as, as Michael uh, said in the last panel, it was significant to get this agreement with China because, uh, you know, first and foremost, it's something they never said before. It's something they never said that uh, that, that was something that was off limits. Uh, and it creates a, a standard, a metric we can hold them accountable to. Uh, and so I think that's important. Uh, I think as far as whether they live up to the agreement, we're watching. The president said we're going to watch. We're going to watch carefully. We're going to look at the information. We have mechanisms in place to do that. We're going to continue to do that. I do think the this is a good proliferation. The proliferation of uh, this norm, because it is one of the norms we, we, we've been championing, where other countries are reaching similar uh, understandings, but even more broadly, we think that no state should, uh, should engage in this. And this is part of part and parcel of a very aggressive movement uh, uh, effort that we are doing to try to promote this and our other norms internationally and get uh, you know, acceptance from a wide, uh, as wide a community as possible. I do think it, it's interesting that before China uh, agreed to that, um, you know, one of the things about norms is one of the key things about a norm that you're trying to get acceptance for internationally is it has to be universally appealable. So if China had a norm saying there's absolute sovereignty in cyberspace, we get to control everything, we're not going to sign up to that. Many, many countries. That's not universally appealable. It doesn't help everyone. Not attacking critical infrastructures, everyone sees benefit in that. And so, so that has led to acceptance. This one, I, I think there might have been some, uh, some uh, view that, well, this is a China the US, and the US problem. But it really isn't. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a global problem. And the fact that China agreed to it, and now the UK has a similar agreement, and Germany is looking for that, I think very much aids people understanding this how that helps the entire world community and helps our efforts. And it can be used. Yeah, I would maybe just um, commit from a slightly different perspective joining uh, you at the end, though, uh, which is, um, it is almost that every government in the world is struggling uh, with uh, trying to get their head around uh, the whole complexity of cyber. And, and I would say that uh, it is inevitable that all countries are becoming more and more responsible players in it, uh, uh, if, if, if not for other reasons, then because ICGs uh, constitute a considerable source of economic uh, growth for, for all of them. And, um, and when it comes to becoming more responsible actors, then I think the value to be had in such agreements uh, or such processes of agreement is uh, getting a much better understanding of each other's red lines. That means uh, where is it that we really need to look into either enforcement restrictions or uh, where it is that we cannot uh, agree to each other's sort of standards of, of compliance. And on this uh, point of sovereignty, I would just uh, say that uh, uh, I would say that there is full sovereignty in the very fact that countries are having these conversations. The question that we disagree about is the exercise of sovereignty. And that uh, is, again, where countries have to be really strategic in uh, tabling their uh, views and, and in, fact, in fact, uh, soliciting support to their views for the international community. Okay. Let's go over here. Charlie Stevenson, SAIS. I have a suggestion for U.S. policy I'd like to get the panel's reaction to. Uh, Forty years ago or so, I helped write the Hughes-Ryan Act, which created a principle that the CIA could do covert operations only with presidential accountability and congressional notification. Would that be a good rule for offensive cyber operations by the U.S.? So, I mean, I, I, one thing that we, we said, and it's a classified directive, but we said that there is a U.S. policy and it's a policy of restraint in, in using offensive cyber capabilities. Uh, that's something I think that, you know, other countries, because m many, many countries around the world are developing offensive cyber capabilities. So, uh, it, you know, it is something where we look at all of our various policy dimensions. We take into account a lot of different issues, and it's not an open the floodgates, but it is very much a policy of restraint. You've heard this from, uh, from DOD as well. Uh, so I won't comment on whether you need a particular kind of legislation, but I think having those policies in place is important. So again, it's not something that's ungoverned completely. Thank you. Hi, still Mark Rotenberg. Um, 
to uh, I Scott. thought for privacy reasons you'd change your name the second time. <laughs> I, I do at some events. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, to Scott, I mean, I wanted to thank you actually for your comments about machine accountability. I think that's a very important issue um, in the cybersecurity world because increasingly we need to think about autonomous devices like drones and vehicles and what the consequences uh, will be of having those out there. Uh, we've argued uh, specifically in support of something we call algorithmic transparency and a change uh, addition to Asimov's laws of robotics, which is that a machine should always reveal the basis for its decision. So that's something to think about. But here's my question to you. Um, to your earlier comment about our increasing dependence on uh, biometric identification, um, certainly there's some upside there because there's better authentication, but there's serious downside as well. I remember when uh, Stephen Brill lost, launched uh, Clear, uh, ran into some financial problems, uh, and then had to declare bankruptcy. They put the biometric database of 185,000 frequent flyers uh, up for auction. And then, of course, OPM is part of the breach, lost control of 5 million digitized fingerprints. Um, so we can change credit card numbers when credit card accounts are compromised. It's not quite so easy when a digitized fingerprint is compromised. What's your thinking on that? So the reality is when we do biometrics, um, we don't actually capture your fingerprint. And you don't want to actually do that because sometimes you have to revoke an authentication token because some flaw has been found in a protocol or replay capability comes up. So for example, with facial recognition, we take a picture of your face, we can pick a thousand points at random, seed some other material, sign it with a TPM, it becomes your ID. If because of something we didn't anticipate, that can now be replayed, we take another thousand points from your face, create a completely unique ID, and you can't, cannot actually take the points and create a real face. And fingerprints have to be the same way. The other thing is, with many of these technologies, your ID, this, which is actually now just a blob of encrypted material, it's not really your fingerprint, is stored locally in the device, not in the cloud. So yes, your device could be stolen, and then someone might figure out, you know, maybe you know, they talked you into giving up your password, and now they can replay from your machine, signed by your TPM, but it can be revoked. Once you complain to someone, it can be revoked and it's recreated. It's not your actual biometric, so it's a different model than the clear model. Look, when the government, I work for the government, they took my actual fingerprints. We don't need actual fingerprints to do a biometric identification. I think you have to design these things to recognize that for legitimate reasons, you're better off not actually having the fingerprint or the face, and you just use it to seed algorithms. Yes, sir. Right in the middle here. Hi, Sean Canuck with the National Intelligence Council. Uh, as the international community establishes rules of the road for states to possess or use offensive technologies in cyberspace, I'm curious if the panelists, and particularly Anakin, as I'll explain in a second, feel that those rules should be symmetric, where all nations have the same privileges and responsibilities, or asymmetric, as we have in the nuclear model, where some states are haves and others are have-nots. Uh, I pose to Anakin as a representative of a non-nuclear power, but I welcome comment from any of the panelists. It is hard to imagine how we would proceed with this uh, proposition that uh, we are satisfied with existing international law and law of armed conflict, and at the same time pursue an asymmetric model of, of, of rules. So um, where I'm going is uh, we could potentially think of an asymmetric model of how those laws are, um, rules are applied, and that uh, could flow from capabilities, uh, capability levels and gaps as they actually do at this point of time. Um, the other question about um, both, like uh, first on offensive capabilities, um, and then uh, why, do, why would we need to rethink rules, meaning I think at this point of time, it is clear that the countries are integrating ICTs in their arsenal uh, across the world. 
And, uh, and I would not necessarily say that this in itself constitutes a threat bigger than we have ever faced from countries. Because in, as a matter of fact, although ICGs may do a lot of damage, we don't see that in state practice and how they are applied. So that comes to the existing law of armed conflict. And uh, the question I would ask there is uh, mainly, are we ready to uh, answer the questions and the first panel touch upon that, what is proportionate? And what is uh, all those principles that are there and how we therefore are to apply those rules? And I think that already becomes a symmetric, as actually has been an interpretation, the implementation of a lot of international law, depending on military power and other power instruments that, that countries possess. Chris, you want to add anything? No, I, I think that, um, um, look, I think one of the things about this area is that uh, you can have a country that doesn't have a lot of technological sophistication but can have capabilities in this area without investing a whole lot. Now, maybe not sustained capabilities, but there are capabilities. So you have to think of, and again, that's why I think you look, as we are at the norms, in terms of effects. You know, what effects should countries not do in peacetime and in wartime? I think you need to look at proportionality, distinction, those other issues, uh, and, and exactly how they work in the space. I actually will just add, I, I think, Sort of at a doctrinal level, it's unlikely that you're going to see a complete decoupling of the cyber weapon, you know, from all the other right. weapons. Well, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things we always see is this, uh, you know, because it gets a lot of headlines, cyber war, that there's going to be a freestanding cyber war. You know, I, I think what we've already seen and what we'll continue to see is this being integrated as a tool that countries use, and we're seeing that already. Right. Yes, sir. Tony Summerlin, I work at the FCC. Um, my question has to do with just recent, uh, like Safe Harbor being overturned, right to be forgotten. Today it was announced the UK passed a law that said all providers had to keep all uh, browsing data for a year and make it available as necessary. I mean, I'm seeing a growing gap in the direction of, of what we're doing for each other across the pond. and. Uh, we're talking about all this kumbaya with China, which is nice, but uh, I, I'm, I just wonder about the gaps that are being created at the individual level and what those arguments might look like. Well, I'm, happy, I'm happy that, you know, so this is a huge challenge for an international, you know, company. Um, Safe Harbor, the U.S., it's been reported that the U.S. and the EU are working on a new framework and trying to get a new agreement in place. We also rely on model clauses that have been approved by the Article 29 Working Party for privacy. The, re the real challenge, though, it seems to me, is um, there's this tension between the idea of a global medicine and sovereignty. Um, and I don't think you can expect countries to necessarily all adopt a common regime because there are a lot of cultural differences and other things. Um, but you do look for some sort of harmony. And what, as an international business, what you look for the most is you don't want uh, conflicting laws in different jurisdictions. You must preserve this for X days, and you may not preserve this for X days, and you're subject to both laws at the same time in the same place. You know, we're fighting a, a case now. Uh, we just had arguments in the Second Circuit where the U.S. government is trying to compel us to produce data from our Irish data center. Um, and the question is, whose law should apply? How do we expedite mutual legal assistance? There's a lot of this tension. I will tell you that, like Chris said earlier about another issue, governments have been arguing over this since the 1990s. I was chair of the G8 subgroup at High Tech Crime. And in one of the early meetings, we went around the table to talk about where the countries were on this notion of transborder searches and access to data. And it was very interesting because, so I'm the chair of the group, so there's a you know, US delegation. And we went around the room and every country basically said, uh, no, you can't do searches in our country. No, you can't do searches in our country. And then the British um, suggested there might be this concept of virtual presence. Like if we can access it, we can get it. And the other countries are like, but you can access everything. And then we got to Italy who said, well, it's kind of interesting because I've been searching your computers for years. <laughs> no, literally, he said, I'm doing a child porn investigation. There's a network drive. I go to the drive. I actually don't know where it is. 
you just no way to know. So anyway, we're going around the table, working this problem for a long time, and after several months, we go around the table to take the pulse of everyone again, and we've been working on other issues as well and come up with 10 principles for law enforcement. But we went around the table and we got to the French delegation that said, no, you cannot do searches in our country, but we need to think about times when maybe we should do something else. So I'm the chair of the group, and I said, I'm sure everyone would like to understand the French change of position. They said, there is no change of position. You cannot do it. But there might be times when we should do something else. <laughs> so when you lead an international delegation, you learn that the thing to do, and do is call a coffee break. So I called the coffee break, and I walked off with the French to the coffee urn and said, OK, you know, what's going on? And they said, look, we were investigating two French citizens for a violation of French law. And they both had AOL accounts. So we went to AOL, and we asked for subscriber data. And we gave them court paper, and they gave us subscriber data. And then we went back to them with court paper and asked for the content of email. And we got back a letter from the FBI saying, we received your request for mutual legal assistance. And we were completely confounded by this. And I said, well, that's because AOL, all their email servers are in Dulles, Virginia. And it's covered by the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. The French said, so explain to us why if two French citizens who have not left France are committing a crime against the French state, we would need the assistance of any foreign government. This is the problem. And so, you know, from a, a company that's international, look, we have data centers in the EU. A lot of our services allow you to choose where you want to store your data. So you can store it in the Irish data center and back it up to Amsterdam. If you're US, you can store it in the US. Um, but there's this constant tension about what the rules of the road should be for data flows, whether people's rights should flow with the data, whether mutual legal assistance should work more effectively so countries less often have to run into this conflict but can assist each other. But these are very hard problems because possession is nine-tenths of the law, and governments do not want to give up their sovereign right to compel people in their territory to do what they say. And I'd say one of the, the, the big issues that Scott really mentioned is you're not going to have exactly the same legal regimes for privacy or anything else, but it's having interoperable ones. And there's been some hiccups recently where we are working to address those. Uh, and, and you know, in Europe, they've had different uh, views of data retention from uh, saying you can't retain any data to you have to retain data, and it's been all over the place. So, so I think as long as we have compatible rules, that's important. On, on China, I don't think we... We believe that these accords at all solve all of our issues with China. So that's, uh, it is an important step, and I will leave it at that. Important and good step. And as Chris said about the attribution question, you know, you, it's not just a question of having identity or something else. You use all the things you right. can get. Right. So I mean, I think you know, in the case of the, the UK, uh, they, like uh, everybody else, including the US, are now struggling with the fact that that businesses have made encryption so much, gen much more generally available. So they're still trying to do their job, whether it's counterterrorism or law enforcement. And so if they can't get it the way they used to get it, they're going to go try to get it some other way. And so I think you know, this is one of these whack-a-mole kind of problems. You know, I mean, the governments have not been, you know, uh, uh, they ha you know, no one's taken away their mission and obligation to perform their duty, whether it's law enforcement, counterterrorism, whatever it is. And, the technology keeps sort of moving things around for them. And so we're going to play whack-a-mole a little bit, looking for, OK, if I can't get it that way, I'm going to go over here and look for it some other way. And I think that you're just going to continue to see that cycle around, in my view. If Question I may, in the back? If I may oh, just yeah, sure, to add a line to that. Uh, well, I think <coughs> what we're seeing here is this sort of um, question about, as Chris said, uh, well, we are in a way also facing the same question at the international level. What do human rights, including privacy, mean uh, online? And we see actually regions, uh, not to mention countries, going different directions. And currently, European trend is clearly with the right to be forgotten, but also repelling, repelling the data retention directive, uh, turning it back to more conservative. Uh, now, that has real-life implications, though, because data centers are not moving to Europe by accident. So there is uh, economy to, and or let's say money to be made in these policies. And of course, countries that uh, care about national security uh, need to now do their own calculus on how they're going to achieve that uh, under, under the 
mechanism in place. But I think uh, the real question will be the European model cannot be accepted most likely as a, as a global standard. And we see other standards emerging. For example, uh, Asian countries, <coughs> Middle East, are, are building their data protection and privacy requirements not on human dignity as Europe, and uh, not necessarily thinking of national security only, but uh, precisely how is a business to flow to that, those countries. So I guess uh, in terms of where privacy law will go, we would have to follow the money. Yep. Yes, sir, the man with the paper in his hand. Alton Fry from the Council on Foreign Relations. The theme of the panel underscores very effectively that the continuing international legal categories of collective defense and self-defense, meaning as a residual possibility, are alive and well. That I think this is a, a very fascinating evolution into the requirement for new practices. But the tempo of potential threats is so accelerating that the question becomes, how can we make responses prompt enough? Therefore, the question. The G. Obama agreement seems to talk about a mechanism to link Chinese and American consultations. Could it point toward a meaningful hotline that could be the basis for prompt information sharing about threats that need to be acted on quickly? And could that bilateral hotline eventually become a multilateral hotline? So uh, this is actually one of the, this is a basic confidence building measure. Indeed, you know, one of the very first uh, bilateral agreements we reached uh, was with Russia several years ago, uh, where we used something called the Nuclear Risk Reduction Center, which is the real hotline, uh, it's not a phone, uh, that connects uh, the two countries and applies to cyber. We also had a, a voice hotline. We also had an exchange of doctrine and other issues. So as we think about these confidence building measures, both bilaterally and multilaterally, yes, I think having hotlines that help de-escalate, make sure there's not uh, a, uh, a misperception or miscalculation, that's one way of achieving it. And I think that's something we are looking at. Uh, but, you know, to your point on collective action, too, there's, there's a number of good things that have happened there. Uh, the last panel talked about NATO quite a bit and said, well, you know, does NATO really apply? Well, actually, yes. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a statement in the Wales uh, Summit that says that Article 5, for instance, applies uh, to cyber. It's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Frankly, Article 5 has always been a case-by-case -case basis, So, but it's, it says that cyber is part of that construct. There's work being done there. So there's a collective action that we've talked about with norms and other issues. Uh, but, but, but confidence building measures are an important part of this three-legged stool, international law and how it applies, the norms below the threshold of armed conflict, and then you know, really building that confidence and transparency and I think a hotline is something that you know, we are trying to execute in an appropriate way. Sometimes it's just having points of contact, knowing who to call in a crisis, knowing how to uh, get the information you need. Sometimes that's law enforcement channels, sometimes that's through policy channels or you know, White House to prime minister channels. So we're, we're looking at all those things. I think one of the things you have to think about is what the command and control structure looks like and whether there even one exists. And what I mean by that is, so I came out of the Justice Department where you had a command and control structure, you have a lot of agents who carry guns, you can put people in prison, there should be a lot of rules and structure. And then in the course of my career, I went to Microsoft where developers are king and it's you know, widely distributed and the like. Yes, you need escalation paths that are quick, particularly for situations where you don't want countries to misread the signs and make high level political decisions that are catastrophic. But at the speed of internet attacks, a lot of the work is actually done by CERT teams and computer security professionals, often not in the government at all, but in the private sector. Like, who found Stuxnet? You know, it was private sector people. And so um, you have to get used to having a distributed, non-command and control structure for a lot of the activity. Yeah. It doesn't mean you don't need a hotline and you don't need escalation paths for the right thing. But the speed of attacks and the breadth of attacks, these asynchronous issues, there's going to be a lot of organic work that command and control structure just can't command and control. And, and there should be. I mean, this is, uh, you know, you don't have one ring that rules them all. You have different connections to deal with different issues. You have a policy connection. The search should be talking together, and that's something we've been promoting very heavily. But Scott also raised an interesting point that some countries, because this is still a new policy area, haven't figured out their internal structure even within their governments. Like, how would you actually escalate something up? And that's part of the work that needs to be done. 
So if it's quick, we have time for one more question. I'll remind everybody this has been an on-the-record session. So we'll take the last question from the man in the back right there. Thank you very much. Uh, Don Daniel, uh, Emeritus Professor at the Naval War College. Uh, I'm interested in finding out how much the issue of protecting sources and methods could restrict our desire to, let's say, raise certain issues in certain countries. We talked about potential hotline with the Chinese, and I can see circumstances maybe where I don't want to call the Chinese. <laughs> you know, I know something is going on. I've got a way to get into it. Uh, it's quite useful for me. It's going to maybe be useful for me in the future. It may hurt, I don't know, Walmart, OPM, or whatever. But I still don't want to indicate to the Chinese or to anybody else that I'm uh, on to what's going on. Is that an issue or not? Look, I, I think I, that's not unique to cyber. That's an issue all the time. But I think that there is uh, you know, much more of a tilt to actually getting things out there and trying to uh, ameliorate the problems. Uh, but, but it's always an issue. So you, know, you want to make sure you can track what activity you're seeing, but you need to respond to it, too, and actually change behavior. I, I will say I, I give the U.S. government credit on this for transparency. Let me be a little facetious here, but you know the president did come out and make a statement that uh, the U.S. government has a bias for defense, so they will disclose vulnerabilities to the private sector unless we don't. Um, and which is really pretty much what he said. He said if we have a national security or public safety reason, we may not disclose. And then Michael Daniel, who was on the last panel, actually published a blog going through the questions they ask in their equities process. Right. Like, is this something we think other people know about so the whole planet's at risk? Is this something that we can use and then have fixed and blah, blah, blah? So the US government's been relatively transparent about this, and I give them credit for that. And, and, I, think I, and I think the reason for that is it's exactly the point you made. I mean, it's the stability of the whole system, and I think that if there was a bias toward not disclosure before, there's certainly a bias to disclosure now. And in fact, in the norms paper that Microsoft published, one of the norms we believe is that countries should have a stated policy for how they handle these mixed-use things that have you know, offensive value, but also put people at risk. Countries should be transparent about how they're dealing with this problem, because it is a balancing of equities, I think. Or transparency is just this telling people, how do you decide? That's right. And uh, I think that's important. So on that note, thank you for your attention.